I mean, they just were doing it very simply. They explained to me that everything has to be done within 25 words or less. These empires are so big that in order to run a successful company, you got to keep it simple because your employees are going to be scared to come and tell the boss, James, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't understand what you just told me. And if you keep it simple, then everybody will have a much higher chance of buying in to what you're saying and therefore implementing the processes that you want. Hello and welcome to the Growth Profit Podcast. My name is James Kennedy. I'm the CEO and co-founder from procurementexpress.com. We take the hassle out of managing your company's purchasing with magical features, but we're not here to talk about that today. Instead, I've got uh, Manny Skivafelix, who is an author just published or about to publish, probably published by the time you listen to this, The Ultimate Profit Management Guide. And... Manny has a very interesting background, a long and storied history in business, and we're going to find out more about what his ethos is for managing profit. But before we get to that, Manny, you're very welcome to the show. Maybe you could just introduce yourselves and tell us a bit about your background for the listeners. You know, I grew up in the restaurant business. Uh, my parents were born in Greece on an island. They immigrated here to the United States, and uh, back then, uh, a lot of Greek people were looking to get into their own businesses. So that was one of the avenues they used. So I grew up in the restaurant business and I learned all about, you know, costing and pricing and things like that at, at an early age. And then I, I made a career change and I went into the bottom of a commercial bank to learn how to be a corporate banker. I did that for about 10 years where I had a lot of great teachers and mentors. And then for the last 20 years, uh, James, I work as a consultant. I am guiding business owners on maximizing profits and overcoming growth challenges. So let's just go back to the beginning. The Greeks have a fantastic reputation for entrepreneurialism. I was listening to the Greek prime minister recently on another podcast, and they've got a reputation for sort of conquering the world. Shipping, I think, is a big deal for them, et cetera. Yeah. And you were telling me just before we started that, you know, I, I believe, what, four of your parents siblings went to the States, but not all of them made it. Tell us about that. On my grandmom's side, my grandmom had 11 siblings and uh, they came to the United States in the 1800s and uh, late 1800s. They didn't like it. So they ended up going back. They went back to, uh, to the island, which I, I found very fascinating. And you have a great love for the islands and Greece, I know still, but what's the difference in outcomes? What difference did it make if you managed to hang out, tough it out, in the U.S. Now that I, I have the benefit of, of hindsight, James, and, you know, I, I was constantly peppering my parents with questions about the life and what it was like. I, I think it was not just for the Greeks, but for all of the immigrants, it was extremely difficult. You know, you came, you're coming to any country that, generally speaking, doesn't want you to be there. You can't communicate because you don't speak the language. And, um, what is your plan? I mean, it's just like for us planners out there, it's like, well, what's the plan? You know, get a job, make money. I mean, it was just really, to me, a very like scary experience. Even now today with internet reviews and, you know, you know exactly what's going to happen before you get anywhere. You know what the hotel is going to be like, you know what the area is. You can do a street view. These people who just stepped onto a boat, basically stepped off the side of a cliff. Like there was no coming back in many circumstances. It must've been really tough where you were in order to want to just take that chance. So what got you interested? You saw your parents run a business, a restaurant in this case. Mm -hmm. That's enough to put most people off in most cases being interested in business. Uh -huh. So did you always know, hey, I'm gonna be in business, I'm gonna be self-employed, I'm gonna be working with business owners. What made you wanna to apply to go and get educated in finance, I believe, or in business as your degree? My parents, I wanna put it very politely here, James, they were very straightforward. You know, one of the first things out of my father's mouth is we do not have a million dollars for you to inherit. <laughs> so you gotta get out there and get to work. So, you know, we were, we were prepared very early on that, you know, work was going to be required. And, and you got to understand, you know, here we are, first generation born in America. We're like, what's this guy talking about with his, you know, heavy accent? We had no idea at the time the struggle that he had been through, you know, to get here and get established. But we really, really didn't have a choice. 
they needed help in the restaurant and you were going to go in and help. And I, I took a shine to it. I, I actually enjoyed it. I like dealing with the people. There's so many aspects in there, you know, dealing with the people, dealing with the math. I liked it. And then I was attracted to the cash every day aspect. So here's a business where you can come home every day with cash in your pocket. That was very attractive. Um, so I, as a young guy, I was I wanted to make the fast money, but I kept my eye on the ball because my parents insisted that we get an education. They said, we don't care what you do, but you better make sure you finish at a minimum college. And because they were not able to finish their educations as a result of World War II breaking out. So that's that's how it started. We'll get into what you learned in college and how that contrasts with what you found in the real world when you got out. But just before I do that, just do you tell your kids the same thing? No, you're not getting any money. And there's no money here. Was that good advice to get from your parents? And have you used that same advice with your own kids? So I don't have children. I have nieces and nephews. Ah. And um, the conversations are different uh, with them. But they're all pretty level headed. And they understand that, you know, we're actually very lucky to be born here. Because now you can compare the children that were born in Greece having a hard time. Greece went through a rough time economically and there weren't jobs. And, and a lot of the, uh, Greece is experiencing a brain drain where their young people are leaving Greece to go somewhere else because there aren't jobs. A lot of those islands still are fairly rudimentary, right? Like there's still an outhouse in some of the places. And mm -hmm. like it's, yeah, it's, going, it's like going back in time. De definitely. So... You got a quite a good education, as I understand it. Was it a business degree or finance degree? What did you study? Yeah, my first degree was business with a concentration in what they called computer information systems back then. Wow. Oh. So you're learning about business and computers. So then when you left college, you graduated, you came across what you've described to me as three billionaire families, and you got to know about how they ran their business. Who were they, by the way? I don't know any billionaires, I don't think so. So when I got out of college, I still stayed in the restaurant business for like another 40 years because, you know, degree was over, fantastic, more free time to, to work. And that's when I started really thinking about the career change. So I went back to school and got a master's in finance. I was 29 years old at the time. And and then I set off to go get a job with a bank on the advice of my advisor from college. She told me to go get into a training program, mm. a formal credit training program. So I went in there and, and then you're moved around to learn the ins and outs of lending in the various segments of banking. And that's when I met the first family. So I was a relationship manager. This family had like 50 relationship managers. Their empire was so big. And. I was able to ask questions and observe and see how they were managing all these companies that were far flung all over the place. James, they couldn't even visit all the locations in a year. Oh. You know, they used to fly like 200,000 miles a year on Delta back then. <laughs> all right. So, so I was constantly absorbing, you know, for example, one business that they bought, big business invoice was touched like 15 times internally. They bought that business and cut it down to two times few times, which I thought was amazing. As someone who sells a purchase order management software, you got my interest straight away. Uh -huh. So was this their tactic that they were just basically efficiency maestros? And did they grow through acquisition or how did they end up with this vampire? Yeah, my understanding is that their father was one of the first people to start doing leverage buyouts in the United States in the 30s. Wow. And the father has an amazing story. And um this, the children are all very successful and they have an amazing story in continuing and bettering what the father started. So, yeah, they they have their own way of successfully managing different cultures, right? right. Different cultures and different businesses. And they focus on the business being profitable and maintaining a sustainable competitive advantage and keeping their employees happy so these businesses can continue to grow generation after generation. Did it surprise you at all the way they ran their business? The biggest surprise was, so when I was first immersed in the restaurant business as a young lad, I noticed that my father, other relatives, they were constantly doing cost of goods calculations in their heads. I didn't fully understand what was going on. When I got into school, and they started showing me like a spreadsheet and stuff like that. I was like, oh, my God, they, they were doing this. All these people were doing it in their heads. They didn't need spreadsheets. So I thought that I was going to get out of school and I was going to 
be calculating, you know, the, the present value of future cash flow, of multiple uneven cash flow streams. Boy, was I wrong. The very wealthy families with empires were doing everything just as simply as my immigrant parents, teachers and mentors. Very simple. So even in this empire, they were just, what, eyeballing it, more or less. It sounds like this. They, I mean, they just were doing it very simply. They explained to me that everything has to be done within 25 words or less. These these empires are so big that in order to run a successful company, you got to keep it simple because your employees are going to be scared to come and tell the boss, James, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't understand what you just told me. And if you keep it simple, then everybody will have a much higher chance of buying in to what you're saying and therefore implementing the processes that you want. And it's not necessary. You don't need all this complication. It was very fascinating for me. It sounds like their formula was a lot more about the communication with the people than it was the manipulation of the spreadsheets. Well, I don't want to downplay. I don't want to downplay. They had their way. Yeah. They were very astute with respect to financial calculations. I want to give you a quick example. They would just calculate a return on equity in the traditional sense where you would take the, let's just call it the net income and divide it by the amount of equity you have in the company. They would calculate the return on invested capital. So they would include the debt that they had borrowed and add that to the equity component and then calculate the return. Okay. So simple, but not simplistic. <laughs> You're right. Uh-huh. The strange thing about this, Manny, is the book title that you have mm-hmm. seems at odds with your career. And you tell me where you tell me where I'm wrong, because like for 10 years, in my words, not yours, had a career selling debt, right? Selling, mm-hmm. selling people money. That seems at odds with ultimate profit management. So what led you to want to write this book? Are debt and profit compatible? I've definitely had a mixed range of emotions, you know, about debt through my career and my parents, which, you know, they, they never knew where their next dollar was coming from because the restaurant business can be unpredictable. They were really big on low debt, but debt and profit to answer your question, they can coexist. It's, it's the amount of debt that you carry, right? Which is going to be, should be based on the roughly on the amount of profit that you're making inside that business. And there's a range that's different for everybody. And you, as a good business owner, you got to be careful that you don't take on too much debt relative to the profit that you're making. Right. Because it could be detrimental to your financial health. I heard a guy once describe, not debt, but something else. He said, it's like a samurai sword. Not everyone should have one. (laughs) Like if you know what you're doing, it's okay. I mean, no one gets into business to try and make a loss, Mm -hmm. right? That I know of. But what are the mistakes you see when people try to run a a profitable business. We'll get back to, you know, is profit cool? <laughs> but mm-hmm. like, w- what are the mistakes people are making and what can they learn in the book about how to avoid them? Uh, you know, one of the mistakes, and it's it's an easy mistake to make, is making a, a math mistake. You know, math is not everybody's strong suit. So you get into business and you're hustling, you're selling, you're gaining some traction. And there are all these other costs that start getting involved as you're growing your business, as you're scaling, your expenses are going up. And you have to factor that in because you're, if you don't factor that in, your margins are actually going to go down while you're growing. Right. You really don't want that to happen. So that's number one is sometimes you don't have time to keep track of the math and you're actually selling something successfully, but it's not profitable enough to keep your business successful. Okay. So you're, you're losing money on every unit, but you're making it up with volume. That old trick. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So now, and I, if I look in the tech press or in different places, I feel like profitability is becoming more in vogue than it had been. You know, we had the zero interest rate environment the last few years. The world was awash with money. There was the COVID checks, people pushing money into, trying to push money into businesses. That was the problem. They couldn't get money in fast enough, seemed to be. Now it's changed. I think a lot of the VCs have gone away. You know, they haven't got access to capital anymore. So if you were giving advice to someone starting out in business today and you had a choice between, you know, raising debt, raising VC money or focusing on profitability, what's your case for the boring, slow path to profits, you know? So the the boring path, in my opinion, gives you, the business owner, the proof 
that you have a business that can be viable. Um, so back to your point, which in my opinion is excellent. These VCs and, and, and other you know, capital sources were throwing money at ventures that were just not profitable. Mm. And, it, and it feels like you know, after 17 years, let's say, since, since 2007, 2008, it seems like they're having a hard time justifying now to the investors that, hey, this thing's still not making money. Is this a viable business if it's not making money? But does that matter if you could just find a greater fool? As long as someone else is willing to pay more for the enterprise value, it doesn't matter if you make profits, right? From my point of view, and, and let's keep in mind that I was brainwashed, right, by the study of finance and banking. And hmm. If you don't have profit, you can't pay that debt back. Right. So the bankers are con they're very keen to make sure that as they're lending you money, you've got the ability to pay it back, right? But they also warned us against the greater fool, as you mentioned. And then the, the interesting piece is, if it's your money, so if, if it's James and Manny's investment, do we want to quote unquote gamble our hard earned money, our family's livelihoods? Do we want to gamble that there is a greater fool out there if we're sticking our money in this business that's not, not really, that's not making money? Yeah. I don't think I personally have the risk tolerance to have an open end funding something every month that's not making money and and the light's not getting any closer, it's going to mentally grind me down. Well, maybe it's personality type thing because you're dead right. There is this sort of, this might be the wrong word, but alpha male sort of just try grow, grow, grow at all costs mm -hmm. and then just, just try and hock the thing onto someone else. I'm being a little bit pejorative now, but just to make it more interesting. I was explaining to you before in the call, we joined the call that, you know, my great grandparents ran a business for more than 150 years, you know, and that no one yes. talks about running a business for 150 years now. No one even uh -huh. considers that's possible. Do you think that's an artifact of a bygone age? Because the fear is you can build profits, but then how long does it last? Do you think it's possible to build like a, a hundred year business in today's world? I don't know if I can answer that question, yeah. but let's talk about it. There, there's so many things going on these days. You know, succession planning is different. Growth is different. You know, so, Sometimes businesses get to the point where they can't grow fast enough organically anymore. You know, They're not gonna make money by selling, uh, let's take the case of a food company. You know, They're not gonna make their earnings by selling another two cans of cinnamon sticks this year. They need to go buy a big business. Yeah. Maybe that was your granddad's business, you know, that's going to tack on 500 million in sales. So I don't know. And then you have the succession planning issue. Your kids, we didn't have all that stuff before. We didn't have all this technology and stuff like that. Do your kids, James, want to follow in your footsteps? You know, do, do they want to go into the bakery business? I mean, these multi-generational businesses, they often, unlike the ones that you work for, they don't survive to the third generation. You know, the first generation makes it, second generation sort of maintains it, just as afraid of not losing it, and then the third generation trashes it. That's what happens a lot of the time. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if it's possible to build a 100-year business. Maybe not, because if I think it, you start a business in the 1800s when your antecedents or ancestors came to America, like that was just a totally different world. And basically nothing changed from 1800 to whatever, 1900s, 1930, 1910, like mm -hmm. very little had changed. But now you consider the same period now, the whole world changes every 10 years. Now we have uh -huh. AI. So who would you recommend? Who's this book for? If you're listening to this, and you're like, well, is this for me? Or if you're listening to this and you know someone, you want to gift it to someone, like, who is the right person to give it to? Gift it to a business owner. So the book's title is Ultimate Profit Management, Maximizing Profitability as You Grow Your Business. So these are all lessons that were taught to me, James, by my teachers and mentors. So I want to give it to a business owner and say, you know what? Every day you're bombarded by stories of billion dollar valuations and unicorns and going to raise money. And it seems like the bootstrapping concept, which is an old concept, right, has kind of gone by the wayside. But there are the majority of businesses out in our, our world are, are bootstrapped by the blood, sweat and tears of entrepreneurs every day. So here's a book that will answer some pretty difficult questions based on what my teachers and mentors taught me. How fast should I grow? How much debt should I take on? Should I take on debt? When do I hire? When do I increase my expenses? So all kinds of practical things that you can actually use and, and it'll make you feel better 
you know, alleviate some of your anxiety. So I have a traditional question that I like to finish out podcasts with here on the Gross Profit Podcast, which is, who is your business hero and why? My business hero? Oh, that's a good one. So I got two of them. One of them is going to be Warren Buffett. All right. And the reason is when he goes and buys a company after he does this, you know, careful evaluation, he keeps the managers. That's the main reason that he's buying the company. They has to have that excellent management. But he tells them, take as long as you want to tell me the good news, but I need to know the bad news right away. This is what he tells the executive managers. So I've always been impressed by that, you know? I love that. And then the other guy is Musk, Elon Musk. It's just impressive what he's been able to accomplish with his leadership, you know, across many different industries. So those would be my two. I mean, that first one with Warren from Warren, if you think about it, even as a business owner, that's what you really want. Like, I feel sometimes I end up like a bit of a hall monitor. Like you're wondering, you're running around and just like looking for mistakes somehow, which is a horrible place to be because I'm afraid that people won't tell me. I feel like I have to go and find it myself. But I love that quote. I'm going to bring that back to the team and give it to, give it to them, you know, and maybe I should bring it, give it to my board. Excellent. This has been great. How can people, first of all, find your book? And secondly, how can they reach out to you, Manny? My book is available on Amazon. So you can either type in my name, which is a little difficult, or Ultimate Profit Management. It'll pop up on Amazon. And you can learn more about me and, and how I help business owners at my website, which is portalcfo.com. P-O-R-T-A-L-C-F-O.com. Well, thanks very much. And thank you, listener, for getting this far in the podcast. Your special bonus prize for staying with us is to be able to sign up for our newsletter. You can get it at procurementexpress.com slash newsletter, where you'll get tips from Manny and many other business leaders to help you in your business endeavors. And uh, there's absolutely no charge for signing up for that newsletter. So go ahead and do it now. Manny, you've been a star. Thank you very much for being on the show. James, thank you for having me. Had a great time. <laughs>